Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm good. I'm good. You're all good. You're ready to sing, right? <laughs> I'm good. Okay. We are going to go ahead and get started after a few minor technical glitches. Um, so we're delighted to have Arun Agarwal here again with us today. Still here. As part of the Department of Geography Anderson Lecture Series. So this is a second talk that he's giving and this is more of a research application type talk. Whereas yesterday it was more theoretical and discussion based. So for those of you who were here yesterday, sorry to repeat, though I'll get the name of your college right today. Because you, you had a name change, right? Because you were Natural yes. Resources and Environment. Yes, that's right. And I've just realized you're not. You're Environment and Sustainability. School. Yes, and we are School for Environment and Sustainability. <laughs> because, yesterday. You know, and, why would you just be off and you can be for? <laughs> so Arun is a professor there, and he is officially in political science, though a lot of his research is in institutions, international, uh, development and conservation in terms of teaching and research. As of 2018, he is also a National Academy member. Um, and I have worked out when we overlapped. I had started my PhD in 1996 when you came to the workshop as uh, yeah, a postdoc. That's right. So yep. we overlapped for one year at Indiana Yep. So, I'm much happened. older than you. Remember that when you try to uh, say bad I'm things, bad words to me. <laughs> about kind of unintended consequences or perverse consequences of some kind of compensation schemes, in this case for a watershed region in the Himalayas. Yep. Thank you, Arun. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Thank you to uh, Mr. Anderson for endowing this lecture series, and thank you to the Department of Geography and to the University of Florida. I love being back here. I was here, I think, maybe five or six years ago, and True to my last visits experience and my two and a half years here when I started teaching, the weather is just divine, so I'm really glad to be here. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you today about some research that we have been doing in the Indian Himalayas over the last uh, decade or so, and uh, the research is focusing on a set of programs that try to enhance both people's attitudes and improve their behaviors and to improve forest cover uh, slash environmental outcomes in this region of the Himalayas. And we'll just come to that. And the general question my research that I'm representing in this paper tries to answer is, how does governance structure environmental and sus slash sustainability outcomes? And so this is a very broad question. And we are going to focus on a particular, very specific kind of environmental governance mechanism or strategy and a very particular set of outcomes, and are three different kinds of outcomes, and I'll talk about each of them. And the basic one lesson to take away from this research is that environmental governance interventions affect not just one thing or not just outcomes in one dimension, but in multiple dimensions. We'll talk about outcomes in relation to attitudes, we'll talk about outcomes in relation to behaviors, and we'll talk about outcomes in relation to forests or uh, condition of forests on the ground. So and governance affects not just one thing, even if the goal is to influence only one kind of outcome. It typically has outcomes in multiple dimensions. So very broadly uh, speaking, there are a whole variety of different ways of carrying out governance or implementing governance. Three most common ones that we talk about are based on markets, so if you think about a payment for environmental services program, or if you think about uh, even subsidies or taxes, they seek to alter the incentives that people have for undertaking a certain kind of behavior, and by changing the incentives, trying to change behaviors. So that's one set of governance, governance interventions that are very commonly used. A second set of governance interventions are what we often call command and control or uh, uh, mandatory requirements or policy or, uh, or legal changes or institutional changes through which different kinds of actors, whether they are uh, state actors or uh, 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 NGOs, 
uh, these institutional changes are the mechanism through which they try to alter the uh, outcomes of environmental uh, processes. And the third set of uh, uh, interventions focus on education or information through which to change environmental outcomes. So think about the effort to reduce the consumption of shark fins and uh, basketball star coming out and saying, stop eating shark fins because it's really bad for the sharks and a large number of people stopping to eat shark fins because they think it's bad for the sharks and it's bad for marine conservation. So you can have these, any of these three different mechanisms, the three different instruments to, ins, uh, to, to uh, uh, implement uh, governance uh, mechanism, to implement governance uh, strategies and through them try to influence governance outcomes. And then in real life, most interventions are a composite or a hybrid of a combination of, a hybrid of uh, information or incentives or uh, regulations or institutions. And community-based conservation, for example, is an example of a, a community-based conservation, for example, uh, represents these hybrid forms which combine information, institutions, and uh, uh, incentives to bring about changes in environmental outcomes. So, you know, you can, when you carry out research on governance, you could focus on any one or more of these governance mechanisms and any one or more of the outcomes, and the goal is to try to link them as closely as possible, which is not always easy. So this just provides a, a different way of representing that same information that you can, you can think of environmental governance as being represented by a triangle in which the three vertices are the pure types of institutions and incentives and information, and community management or a whole range of other mechanisms are a composite or a hybrid of com different combinations of these three uh, pure types. This talk in particular focuses on the role of incentives in environmental governance. So how can we change governance, environmental governance outcomes by providing a different or higher or lower sets of incentives or disincentives for positive versus negative behaviors so as to bring about different outcomes, right? So positive incentives to encourage positive behaviors for the environment, negative incentives to discourage negative behaviors about the environment, and through, these, through the administration of these incentives, bring about different, more socially desirable <laughs> environmental outcomes. So ecosystems and ecosystem services became, uh, the concept became very uh, widespread or broadly known after the Millennium Assessment and the issuing of the multiple reports on the Millennium Assessment. And this work has gained a significant purchase over the last few years. The most recent report from NCP, the Nature's Contributions to People from IBES, also focuses on nature's contributions to people. And it has been converted into policy-relevant governance interventions through strategies such as payments for ecosystem services. And the basic idea here is very simple. Environmental services or ecosystem services have a value. Those who produce them often do so at a cost to themselves. To make the production of environmental services more widespread, those who are producing them should be compensated for the cost they incur. So payment for environmental services is one policy relevant translation of the work on ecosystems and ecosystem services so as to bring about more positive environmental outcomes. There are, just as there are a lot of uh, adherents of, or adherents, adherents, Propo proponents, <laughs> proponents of the idea of environmental services and payments for them to bring about positive outcomes. There are also a number of people who criticize them. Those who see environmental services, the idea of environmental services and payments from them as leading to commodification of nature. Those who talk about the need for human beings to relate to nature as a result of human beings being an integral part of nature. So the ecosystem services approach separates humans from nature, and many people would argue that's not good. We are part of nature, so we shouldn't be thinking about our separation from human nature. And they often also see environmental services or ecosystem services as a way of just making gestures, reform gestures towards bringing about more positive environmental outcomes. But 
to really make a difference, you need to just burn it all down to bring about complete system change and have a revolution. So there are all these different grounds on the basis of which work on ecosystem services has been criticized. And overall, it's an argument between those who believe in consequentialist approaches, instrumental approaches to environmental change versus ethical or uh, deontological approaches to environmental change. In this uh, presentation, I'll focus on the consequentialist aspect of ecosystem services arguments and assess whether more benefits to people lead them to undertake more or less environmental protection, lead them to think more or less positively about the environment, lead to better or worse environmental outcomes. So at one level, it might seem really strange to be thinking that if you pay people to do something, they will do less of it, or they will think negatively about it, or they will create behaviors. You will create behaviors that lead to worse outcomes than if you had not paid for them. But this is an important question to ask because we really don't have a very good sense of how is it that people react when they are paid to do something that is oriented towards the social good. We have good in intuitions about what happens when you pay people to do something that is a private good, right? You work and you get paid and you create and do more work and you get more you get paid more and then you do more work and you get, in, get into this uh, cycle of a positive or virtuous cycle from the point of view of employer, of your employer that when you pay people more, they do more work. There are some arguments and there are some studies that even question that. But in general, I think you can say that when it is a private good, paying, paying people more leads them to produce more of that good. But we don't know what happens when it's a social good. And the existing set of theories about what our intuition should be leads us to two very different, even diametrically opposed conclusions. So one set of theories are the standard economic and rational choice theories. And they would essentially say what conforms to our general intuition that if you increase benefits for a particular kind of action, then the willingness of the person receiving the benefits to undertake that action increases, right? But there's a second set of theories which have gained some currency and some significant empirical support, which are what are called theories about intrinsic motivations. And they, they basically talk about how all the, all, the, all the things that we do are a result of two different kinds of motivations, intrinsic motivations and extrinsic motivations. And what we do is the result of those two coming together. So for some things, you just need intrinsic, only very small amounts of extrinsic motivations. So think about the times when you go and volunteer at a, at a shelter. Or think about times when there's a blood donation drive and you go and contribute blood. So even though you're not receiving any extrinsic support for that, you still do it because you want to do it. So intrinsic motivation is doing something just because you want to do it. Extrinsic motivation is doing something because you receive some external reward, some recognition, some benefit for doing that action. So all actions, so scholars of motivational crowding would argue, are a result of a combination of intrinsic and extrinsic motivations. And the balance of these is what leads you into actions. And how intrinsic and extrinsic motivations are affected by payments differs. So payments may reduce your intrinsic motivations for doing something, but increase your extrinsic motivation. They may. Uh, 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 and this may happen to the extent, to an extent that your entire set of intrinsic motivation for doing something is crowded out. And so the question is, what do we see when we pay people for doing something that is socially, that is a social good? How does the balance of intrinsic and extrinsic motivations play out? So this work was carried out in Himachal Pradesh, and this just gives you a location. And I only included it because I'm giving a geography talk. I really don't do anything about making maps. So 
somebody was very kind and helped me produce this map. Uh, and it, the colored areas give you a sense of where this program was implemented. Roughly about 25 districts, more than uh, three and a half million people in the first phase. They just launched the second phase of this program, a total expenditure of roughly about $70 million, a collaboration between the Himachal Pradesh state government, forest department, and the World Bank. This is the empirical setting, and this gives you a sense of why we decided to go there to carry out this research. The other option was to do it in the Caribbean, but we didn't really have mountains in the Caribbean. And these are the key features of the intervention itself and its context. So the intervention was called the Mid-Himalayan Watershed Development Program. It's a program that was implemented in 2006. Uh, it's a, as I said, it's a partnership between the state government and the World Bank. And it was implemented by the Forest Department, about 2,500 villages of the, of the state in the first phase. The state itself is relatively small, both in area and population. High population density, especially for the area that can be cultivated. A lot of out migration, strong civil society, significant social awareness compared to the rest of India and Indian states in Himachal Pradesh. So before I uh, uh, go into what the program did, I should say that we were carrying out work on a completely on a very different project in Himachal Pradesh in 2004. And that's when I came to learn about the impending implementation of the Mid-Himalayan Watershed Development Project. And we got this idea of collecting data on, in villages and from households that were going to be covered by the project versus those that were not. So if you look at this slide, it gives you a sense of the distribution of the area that were covered versus not. And even for the districts which are shaded, it wasn't 100% coverage. So some villages, so the villages that were selected were fully covered. Those that were not selected, nobody was covered. OK, uh, so we uh, found out the places where this project was going to be implemented. And then we selected a set of villages in which to do an initial round of data collection as to serve as the baseline before the implementation of the project. And then the project started getting implemented, and we got some money from the NSF to go back about five years later to collect a second round of data from the same baseline households. So what did the program do? It's, it had three different uh, uh, mechanisms uh, to, to implement its uh, overall objectives, to achieve its overall objectives. One was to promote participation in meetings of different kinds, meetings, one-on-one -on -one meetings, or meetings between project personnel and small groups of villagers, or a full village meeting where project personnel came and described what the project was and why it was good and what it would do and how it would benefit everybody. So a lot of information about the project about environmental, uh, uh, about trying to achieve better environmental outcomes, about protecting forests, about not cutting down trees, etc. The second mechanism, or the second instrument that the project used was to provide private benefits to individuals. So these were benefits that went to individual households, and they included things like seeds and fertilizers, livestock, chicken, sewing machines, barbed wire to enclose their fields, and so on and so forth. Essentially things that could be the things that from which benefits flowed to a single individual or to a single household. And then the third set of instruments was a whole bunch of different small scale collective goods, which went not to any particular family, but to a group of families. So repairing of collective uh, water harvesting tanks, uh, irrigation channels, footpaths, meeting grounds, so all kinds of different small-scale collective goods, which benefited not the entire village, but households that lived in the proximity of the small infrastructure works. And our design was to select five panchayats, which is roughly about uh, 15 villages, uh, which were covered by the project, 15 outside, and then to interview about 2,200 households in these 30 villages and then repeat the interviews with the same households. And we had about a 72% uh, retention rate, uh, number of households had split, uh, and then we didn't collect data on one panchayat, one of the panchayats, because then after the data collection, we found that the control and the treatment, so to speak, panchayats were very different from each other. 
Uh, and we collected data on a whole range of things, on motivations, behaviors, uh, forest plots for the common forest commons areas from which they were harvesting different uh, benefits, primarily fodder and grazing and small firewood, uh, as also the nature of participation in those, remember those three different kinds of instruments that the project was using, and on a whole bunch of different covariates. And our, goal, and our uh, approach was to use statistical matching to try to understand how households that were as similar as possible to other households in the control areas uh, versus the treatment areas, what was the change in their motivations, in their behaviors, and in their forests, okay? So the question is, first question we ask is, what is the effect of the program as a whole and its three different mechanisms on, particip on par uh, participation in meetings, private benefits, and collective benefits on the motivations of people for around the environment. And the way we tried to assess motivation was to ask this question, if forests are to be protected, what's the more important reason for their protection? Environmental or economic? And select only one answer, both in the first round of data collection and in the second round of data collection. And responses in the first round and in the second round were more or less evenly split, a small decline from the first round to the second round in the direction of people saying economic reasons are why you should protect forests, but a relatively small, statistically non-significant change. So this gives you a sense of how this change was distributed between the treatment and the control villages uh, among the respondents and and essentially what you see is that there's a big change in the treatment versus the control villages from saying protect forests for environmental reasons to saying protect them for economic reasons. So those who are in the project villages or treatment villages were much more likely to say protect forests for economic reasons, not environmental reasons, okay? So what about the effects of these specific mechanisms, these three different instruments that the program used? And this gives you a sense of how the distribution of responses was uh, uh, arrayed by these different instruments. So the first one is participation, which is essentially the information benefits, what, what happened as a result of people participating in that versus people receiving information, uh, people receiving livelihood or private benefits versus people receiving collective or communal benefits. And what you see here is that for all the three, the participation in the project overall, the participation in meetings or information benefits and the receive, 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 receipt of livelihood or private benefits, there's a change in motivations from people saying protect forests for environmental reasons to people in the second round saying protect them for economic reasons, except for those who received collective benefits. Those who received collective benefits were more likely to say protect forests for environmental reasons rather than economic reasons. And then we also looked at what happens when you consider the three different treatments in combination. So collective, collective, uh, uh, private, and information, and then combinations of collective and uh, private, private and information, information and collective, and then all three of them. And then some people received none, despite the fact that everybody was supposed to receive some benefits, so we also included that group. And the results of the combinations of treatments are almost predictable from considering them individually. So when you look at the effects of only meetings, that's the biggest change from, in terms of people saying protect forests for environmental to people saying protect them for economic reasons. So that's the direction in which you see the biggest shift happening. When they receive only communal benefits, you see the biggest shift happening in the opposite direction. People begin to say protect forests for environmental reasons rather than having said protect them for economic reasons. And then the combinations of these are, there's a small, uh, there's still a negative effects of meetings in combination with livelihoods, but a very small and very positive effect of communal or uh, uh, collective benefits in combination with livelihoods, but very small. And then communal and meetings, again, is so very simple. So the, the combination of, for people who received a combination of benefits, their changes in motivations are 
predicted by what their changes were based on individual uh, treatments. So what is going on here? Uh, so we think that what is going on here conforms more to the arguments made by those who believe in the distinction between intrinsic versus extrinsic motivations rather than treating motivations as being homogeneous or the same across everything that you do. We also find that all mechanisms that the project used activated motivations. By themselves, meetings have a negative effect. Private benefits have a very small negative effect, which is not statistically significant. And collective benefits have a strong positive effect. And you know, the positive and negative are just artifacts of how we coded the data. It just means negative essentially just means shift from environmental to economic, and positive means shift from economic to environmental. So this is as far as motivations are concerned. And you might say, oh, well, fine, motivations change, who cares? <coughs> but what about behavior? That's the real thing. If behavior has not changed and motivations have changed, you don't care. So let's look at what happens to behavior. So we look at two kinds of behavior. One is political participation, and one is environmental use. So political participation is represented by number of days campaigning in local elections by people who are in these villages. So those who are participating and those who are, camp those who are campaigning in local council elections and those who are participating in it are essentially engaging in a, a competitive game. It's a zero-sum game. There are two different candidates standing for election. Only one of them win wins. If your candidate wins, you've won. If your candidate loses, you've lost. Those who have won are winning at the expense of those who have lost. The second kind of participation we look at is participation in meetings of the local council after the elections have taken place. So in those meetings, participation is not zero-sum game. Uh, those who go to those meetings can hope to get some benefits from those meetings. Right? So what do we find? What we find is that households in project villages campaigned fewer days compared to households in uh, non-project or in the control villages. Within project villages, participants became more active in direct democracy and less active in electoral activities. And this gives you a sense of the extent of change that happened in terms of participation in political behavior of these two different kinds. So in both cases, for the competitive activity, that is to say in electoral participation, people's participation levels went down. When it comes to more cooperative participation, it went down in those villages that were in the project. Uh, those, it went down for those villages that were in the project. So being in the project or being in the treatment reduced your uh, reduced your behavior, participatory behavior, both for competitive and for non-competitive activities, collaborative activities. But if you were in, uh, in the project villages and you participated in, uh, uh, in the project, then your likelihood of, att of attending council meetings went up. So remember I said that even in the project villages, some people didn't receive any benefits from the project. So for those people, the level of participation went down for both the competitive and the collaborative activities. What about behavior in relation to conservation? So remember, I said the two major forms of benefits or harvesting activities that people undertake in these forests are for energy and for livestock. That is to gain firewood and to graze their animals or to extract fodder. And what we find, so we used eight different indicators, four for uh, energy use and four for livestock practices to look at changes in conservation behavior. And what we essentially find is that there's widespread crowding out of forest conservation behavior in all the project villages among the project households. And this gives you a sense of how the, uh, uh, what is the difference between, uh, uh, in conservation behavior between the project, uh, uh, in the project uh, uh, villages compared to the non-project villages for these different indicators for energy use. And this is for livelihood uh, practice, livestock practices. And in all the cases, you see that the sign of the change is negative, which is to say that they're undertaking more extractive activities. 
In some cases, the sign of the change is uh, uh, negative but non-significant. Non in the one case where it is negative, uh, it is positive, it's also non-significant. But everywhere where it is significant, it is uh, negative. Sorry. So both for livestock practices and for energy use practices. Uh, and these are the signs for these different indicators that we used. And the first four are, are the negative, for the first four, negative signs it incre indicate reduced conservation behavior. And the, for the last four, the positive signs also indicate reduced conservation behavior because these are about switching from forest-based practices to alternative practices. And finally, we looked at what happened to the forest commons on which villagers depended in the project versus the non-project villages. And I'll present the results only for two sets of commons because the pattern is the same for all the four councils, uh, panchayats for which we collected data. So this is the, we, to look at forest conditions, we measured mean basal area in a sample of community forest plots. And these are for forest plots surrounding these four pairs of treatment and control uh, panchayats, so the project and non-project panchayats. And the main result is that forest conditions improved somewhat in control uh, panchayats for the control cases, and they declined in the uh, uh, treatment uh, cases. And this gives you a sense of the change in mean basal area in these different uh, councils. So what are the caveats for this uh, study? One, that it's a quasi-experimental study rather than having randomized the treatment. So some of the results are, uh, uh, we can't be as confident of the results we have uh, compared to a randomized treatment study. Uh, we did seek to take into account all the different covariates that affected assignment into the treatment and that affected the outcomes. But that is only true for observational uh, variable, uh, things that could be observed. Second, there's a heterogeneous uh, treatment in the sense that there are a number of different things going on at the same time. So we are looking at the joint effects of a number of different things that the project is doing rather than having a very clean uh, treatment. And third, the, the mediating conditions, so the contextual conditions that affect what happens as a result of treatment are also not distributed randomly because these are uh, panchayas that we selected based on how closely they were matched to each other for the treatment versus the control cases. Overall, I think what we can say on the basis of this study is that uh, when you are exposed to a sustainable development program which seeks to compensate you or provide you some benefits for undertaking environmentally positive actions, there's some conditional crowding out of motivations, particularly in response to treatments that are only about providing private benefits or information and not about uh, pro small amounts of private benefits and information and not collective benefits. There's some crowding out of conservation behavior as a result of, this pro of such projects. There's some degradation of local forests and there's some demobilization of electoral activities and some crowding in of motivations with collective benefits. And finally, some mobilization of participation in direct democracy or collaborative activities in the case of people who receive benefits. And some general effects or some general arguments about payments for environmental services, often when people who are advocates of environmental services they talk about implementation of these projects. They talk about a whole range of preconditions that should be met for such projects to be successful. These preconditions are very similar to the functioning of competitive markets. They relate to economic and institutional, informational, and motivational characteristics of the people for whom or the context in which these projects are implemented. Most of the time, in the real world, these conditions are not met. So what we need to do is to try to understand better what effects of payment for environmental services or compensatory governance mechanisms are instead of assuming that the preconditions or the assumptions they have about the world are being met and the effects of these programs 
will be in the direction of more positive environmental outcomes. So if you think of things like RED or the Sloping Lands Conservation Program, these are huge programs with billions of dollars in investments, and we don't really have sufficient evidence for defending the, uh, defending the assumptions that justify the implementation of these programs. And that is all. Thank you. Yes. Very interesting. So maybe you can also say your name, and because I don't know you, and maybe some other people also here don't know you. Cynthia Simmons and Geography. Hi. Hi. Um, I just have a, actually I've got a number of different questions, but just for clarification, timing. So they, they got a one-time benefit. So it's not like payment for ecosystem service; they get paid monthly and would continue throughout the program. But if they, if it starts in 2006, they get a benefit. And at the time that you do the survey, they're getting that benefits, and they may have one motivation. But then, you know, five years go on, and they've already, they're not getting any more benefits. So by the end, it may be, you know, they, their motivation isn't necessarily the same. I mean, both in terms of the crowding out that maybe they would have done it themselves if it wasn't for that economic benefit. But by the end, since they had an economic benefit, they want another one. Or, so does the timing have a factor that you have the one time? Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, I'm absolutely sure that it does. So there are two different possibilities. One is that the shift in, in the answer to our question about motivations is more or less random, that you have had a decay in any effect that the receipt, receiving of benefits produced of these different kinds. It just sort of decomposed in various ways, and what we are capturing is something random. So all that we have is going back to the same families, asking them the same questions, and seeing whether there's an association between what they received and their motivations, what they received and their behaviors, what they received and the outcomes, right? right? So it's possible that there's something else going on. We try to think of a whole range of other things, such as changes in people's incomes, changes in family size, we control for these things, and those all, after having control for all these, we are reporting these effects. Right. Yeah. But I guess my, my question was in terms of if they receive the benefit in 2006 when the program starts, yeah. and then you ask them their view or their motivation. In 2011, yeah. So you didn't ask them in 2006 or weren't comparing? So the, it's hard to, so this is, you know, when you're conducting an experiment where you're randomizing the treatment, you know exactly when the program is being administered you know exactly when somebody is getting the treatment. This is a government program. It is being administered over five years. And people are not, some people are getting treatments throughout the five years, every six months, every three months, every year. Some people are getting benefits once. Some people are getting benefits two times. So it is very hard to control for what is going on in a government-run program. So essentially what I would say is that because there's a great heterogeneity in the administration of the treatment, the effects of the treatment are likely to be diluted, right? So when you measure it at the point of administration, you should probably see a stronger effect. But we are seeing a signal through all of this noise, despite the long period over which this treatment is being administered. So in, in this particular case, what we should see as a result of the dilution of the treatment and, for the, and the time period over which the treatment is administered is a weakening of the program signal. Nonetheless, we are seeing a signal. Yeah? Jack. The crowding out idea is really fascinating. I have a fairly simple question. Uh, in a lot of payment offset, programs, the payments come at the end of the year in which you didn't before us. Um, if they come at the beginning, then you have more money to buy chainsaws or cows or um, whatever. Yes. So in this case, the, it sounds like it was very variable, yes. but it wasn't an ex-ante kind of situation. Is yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's pretty much right. So, so, I will, so let me put it uh, slightly differently. I would say that there is a tremendous diversity 
in the way payments for environmental services programs are implemented. In some programs, you have an exactly similar situation as we see here, which is people are selected, they get a benefit, and that's the end of it. Nothing else happens. In some programs, payments are administered at regular intervals, but there's no measurement of outcomes. You just get the benefit because you're part of the program. In some programs, yes, there is a measurement of the benefits. There's a measurement of the effects of your actions, and there is some modulation of the amount of benefits you receive in accordance with the actions you took. But I would say those programs are a very small proportion of the kinds of variety that we see. So, for instance, so I, you know, I don't work on PES programs, so I was talking to Sven. And Sven Wander, who uh, is a strong proponent of these uh, payments for environmental services, his view was that all of these are examples of payments on environmental services. And what you are essentially doing is you're, so, you know, from all the way from something that essentially gives you uh, 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 an economic incentive for free, so to speak, because you're not really looking at what the behavior change is or what the environmental outcome is, to the situation where everything is being very rigorously monitored and measured. And the reason most programs don't do it is because it's very expensive to do it, in, in relation in particular to the costs of the incentives versus the costs of measurements. So it's often a lot of program administrators see more benefits overall from just giving the money to a few, few more people. Right? And, and the other thing I would say is that often when you measure the effects of payment for environmental services, which are administered for very specific objectives, and you look at both the input and the output, you look at the output in relation to what the input is supposed to do. You look at the outcome that is supposed to be affected by the payment. But when you're giving a payment, money is fungible, and you can use it for a whole variety of things. So, if you look only at the key output or key indicator in which you're interested, you are actually not measuring all the different effects that the program is producing. So that's, I think, another issue, that when you're looking at effects of any of these programs, it's crucial to look at the whole suite of possible outcomes that the program is producing instead of only deforestation, only soil erosion, only carbon sequestration. And that's, I think, true for a whole range of, well, I'm going off into a totally different tangent, so I'm not going to go there. But essentially, I'd say, in many ways, this program resembles a number of programs that are seen as being payments for environmental services. Uh, but you are right that if you wanted, if you have a strict definition of a PES program, you would be measuring the impacts and you would be delivering benefits metered according to the amount of environmental change that your behavioral change is producing. Yeah. So there was someone, maybe Cheryl? I, I, I've forgotten now. There's some. OK, so go ahead, and then you, and then I think you. Yes, OK. Yeah, yeah. And so, that I did see you had LPG there, things like that. Yes. You would think, it seems that those incentives weren't necessarily directed towards. Yeah, so I'll say what the program's thinking was. The idea was that if you give seeds and fertilizers to people, you move them away from a reliance on forests to relying on their agricultural fields. And the other one, the LPG thing was not being given out by the program. We were just looking at whether there was substitution of firewood extraction by moving to LPGs. So it was not so much whether it is an environmentally positive activity. It was more about whether it is a positive activity in terms of the program's goals, which was to reduce deforestation. Yeah. Okay. It, it seems like yeah, and <laughs> yes, you're right. Okay. Yeah, so we did look at uh, the uh, thing, and this was something that uh, you also asked, Cynthia. We did look at change in income and change in asset uh, uh, portfolios. 
And those had no correlation with change in, uh, changes in the uh, uh, motiva reported motivations. And between the two sets of households in the treatment or the project and the control villages, there was no, on, the, on average, there was no difference either in the changes in these. Yeah. So yeah, we did, you know, we did, we wanted, to, you know, you can never identify all the possible things that are affecting your results. But the thing that we could think of, we tried those. We have tried those. You had a question. Um, thank you for your talks. I have two questions. So first your name and... Okay. I'm Saman and I'm a student here. Okay. So um, my first question was you said you all measured four metrics of the ecological... Like you, 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 you mentioned the base layer of the trees. Yes. So I wanted to introduce about what the other three metrics were. What the other three measurements were? Okay. Mm -hmm. And my other question was in the beginning you said that the participants who were exposed to the meeting showed a negative shift in attitudes from environmental yes. to economic, but those who received these small scale community goods showed a positive change. Yes. Why do you think that is? I mean, what you're saying is Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I, I think for the first question, in terms of the things that we measured, we basically looked at trees and we looked at basal area. We also did height measurements, but I think those are less reliable, so we report only the basal area changes. And we also identified them down to the species levels. So those were the measurements we took in the forest. And there was very little change in the overall uh, tree diversity index for these treatment and the forest and the control panchayats. Uh, your second question, why do I think this is happening? So I, I'm not entirely sure, right? So I think what we have essentially found is a program level impact and a mechanism level impact of what has happened, right? So we don't know what underlies that. So we, can, we have some ideas and we have some thinking about what underlies that. Uh, one, uh, and that one set of uh, speculations essentially comes from research that says, so we do think that the uh, findings confirm the intrinsic versus extrinsic motivations and their effects on behaviors, right? Uh, but why these intrinsic motivations are changing in the direction they are as a result of these three different mechanisms, that's a matter of some speculation for us. And I would say uh, one body of research that looks at effects of uh, incentives on intrinsic versus extrinsic motivations is encapsulated in a phrase that was used in the title of a paper which says, either don't pay or pay enough. So very often when people are paid for these, uh, pay for these environmental services that they produce, the amount of payments are very small. And so the effect of those on extrinsic motivations is also very small. But what researchers have also found that even a very small payment can completely eliminate your intrinsic motivation because you see that kind of behavior or that action as being valued, as, being, as having a market value. So you stop valuing it for, in terms of your own motivations. The second thing that people have also found, or researchers have also found, is that if in a group you have some people getting payments for undertaking a given action and others not, right? So it's the same action that some people are doing and other people are doing, but these some people are getting paid and others are not, you reduce the intrinsic motivations of those who are not getting paid even more than those who are getting paid. Because they, they're not getting a payment and they're seeing somebody else getting paid for it. And they're like, why the heck am I doing these things and not, even when I'm not getting paid and somebody else is? So I think what is going on as, a, as the effect of, what is going on in terms of the effect of this payment on the intrinsic motivations is a combination of these three different things. Right. Now the question of why are people getting a positive support for the intrinsic motivation when they're receiving a collective benefit? And there the argument would essentially be that because they are not getting a cash payment individually, but the whole group is getting a, getting a benefit, it is not undermining their intrinsic motivation. Instead, it is supporting their intrinsic motivation because they see everybody benefiting from it. Some of, so that's why I've presented the results of uh, effects of meeting, and then effects of meeting in combination with collective benefits, yeah. uh, individual benefits, and all three. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yes, sorry. Kathy, you all for yeah. resources and conservation. Yeah. I find myself wondering about the, the subsistence level and the educational level. Of yes. The, because there may just not have been enough of a framework for yeah. these ideas uh, to take hold. Yeah. Um, you know, we can teach university undergraduates about ecosystem services easily, but you take it down mm -hmm. two steps. Yeah. Yeah, that's a very good point because the same information uh, given to very different people may be interpreted very differently, absolutely. Uh, so we can't get at the different ways in which people interpreted the information they received. So one, but it's one, so what we did include uh, education and uh, uh, not subsistence levels, but the amount of cash versus non-cash incomes that households had in our regression analysis and separately in our matching analysis. But one thing that we could do to get at whether people receive this information differently is to use an interaction term, which we actually have not done. So that's a good idea, and we can, we can do that. Yeah. Yes, please. Both. Okay. Yeah. So we included village as one of the matching covariates. Okay, so you match people treated in village A to people treated, non treated in village A. Yes. So we did uh, a whole different, uh, a whole series of different kinds of matching. One in which we matched people who received the treatment with other people in the treatment villages who did not receive the treatment. A second, when we matched, where we matched people uh, who received the treatment with uh, any other person in any of the treated villages, right? And the third was across the treatment and the control village. Uh, the third was uh, a matched a person in the treatment villages with people in the control villages. Did you find any differences? There are differences, but the Net, but the uh, sign and the significance don't change. So there's a small change in the uh, size of the average treatment effect. Uh, I don't present that, but I could I could show it. Uh, the 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 range of changes is between negative 0.11 to negative 0.18. Because the program was over like five years, like did you realize those village where more people get the treatment, like did it kind of impact the nearby village to kind of on the road of behavior that you see? Change? Yeah, so the treat the control villages that we selected were between uh, three, 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 four miles to seven, eight miles away from the control uh, from the treatment villages, and. The reason why we picked these is because there is less interaction among people in the treatment versus the control. We see the spillover effects as being much more likely for families within the treatment villages rather than between treatment and control villages. So we don't think that there's a, neg there's a spillover effect that is occurring between the, from the treatment villages to the control villages. Yeah, yeah please. When you when you um, you question the same household yes. two times, like, yes. like, so did you make sure that it's the same person answering or like a whole? Yes, it's the same person answering, and we actually had a very high response rate, so very low attrition between the first and the second round, both in terms of the households and in terms of identifying the right person, and that's because in several cases our enumerators went back like three times to the household so that they could find the same person. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Please. Sorry again. Yeah. So it's the middle model watershed that I'm programming. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I, its main aim is soil and water conservation. Yes. So I was just wondering if you look at metrics of, say, soil or water conservation. Yeah, we did not. Yeah. Because in so, some sense, if the program is paying people to achieve that, you would measure the success. Yeah. yeah. So 
you know, so you, you can say that, I think the program also says that the goal is soil conservation, but the mechanism for soil conservation is increased forest cover and increased ground cover. So it may be the aim of the program, but even the program doesn't measure levels of soil erosion. So, you know, they can say whatever they want, but we just went by what they're doing. Yeah. Did, did you have a question? Yeah. Um, just a thought. In the, the benefits they're receiving in yeah. grain and fertilizer mm -hmm. tend to go towards the male side of the family, um, whereas the women are going to be the ones out collecting fuel. Was there any program designed trying to kind of connect those two and make sure that there's communication <coughs> to account for those gender dynamics? Yeah, I think this is a, a gap in what we did. I think some of the benefits do, uh, do go more commonly to women. So chickens are often kept by the women rather than by men. But I think you're right that the larger proportion of benefits as the program was designed went to men. Yeah. yeah. And did you do any analyses on like, differences in perception between the two genders? So we did look at how uh, the change, so because we went back to the same person, uh, same respondent in the household each time, and we, like for half of our respondents were women and half were men, the average change in reported motivations was not different, statistically significantly different between the two. Yeah, sure, sure, yeah. So how were the results received by the World Bank and by <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think I said at the beginning that uh, the World Bank has just funded a second phase of this uh, uh, project. So the World Bank is carrying on with its efforts to Did protect the environment. So we shared this with the, so, you know, there's a significant uh, staff turnover. Not turnover means people leaving the bank, but leaving one project and moving on to another one. So we did share the results of the study with the task team leader for, the, for this project at the bank. Uh, who wrote back with a very nice uh, email thanking us for this, uh, for sharing the results. <laughs> yes, the World Bank has a lot of very good people. Yeah. You have to speak up a little bit because I can't hear you. Yeah. This same experiment, was experiment, would have been done in a different uh, setting, in a different community, and I don't know, perhaps this is the first time the World Bank does an intervention there, perhaps not. You know, how does that differ from the... Yeah, so you, you, you know, so your question, uh, anything I say would be pure speculation, because to really answer your question, I would need to do a similar study in uh, other places as well, and I actually would like to do something like that. Uh, it has not yet uh, happened. Uh, I think the, the context has a very important role to play in the findings that we have. And I think it's in particular uh, true when it comes to things like changes in environmental perceptions and motivations and awareness of the environment. I think overall, because Himachal is a small state, uh, high levels of education, low levels of illiteracy, relatively well connected to the, uh, to, to the news and media and broadcast world. I think in general, perceptions of, about the environment and about the need for environmental protection and the role of forests in, in, uh, hill, in the life of people living in the hills are strong and positive. And we see a difference in, the, you know, in, in those motivations when we look at the control uh, cases where the positive environmental motivations are increasing with, when you don't do any matching-based analysis, right? But even when you do the matching-based analysis, there's an improvement in the control cases and a decline in the uh, treatment uh, households. So I think we can say that where you have a context of improving uh, awareness or increasing awareness of the environment, a payment for ecosystem services program may have even more uh, uh, 
negative effects on environmental awareness than in a context which is very different or which is different. I think it's a low income context. So the other thing that may be possible to say is that if you were going to implement such a program in, uh, in a region where the incomes are high or assets are high, you'd have to pay a lot more. And the levels of benefits would need to be much higher for the program to have any effect. I said something like that in response to one of the questions, but I think overall one would want to emphasize that. If you're going to undertake a payments program, you need to really compensate people in proportion to what they have done, rather than giving them some small token benefits. Right? Uh, I don't know that I can say very much about how cultural differences would play out, because this is I mean, I think the effects of culture on the program outcomes are very, very hard, I think, at least in my mind, to disentangle. Uh, they all sort of are part of a Himachali culture. This is a big area, and the differences can be significant even over small distances in, in the hills. But overall, I think there's still a strong sense that people, people among people in Himachal that they are part of the same hill culture, part of the same uh, Himachali culture. So I don't know. This doesn't give you a very good answer to your question. <laughs> yeah? Hi, um, my name is Susanna. I just recently graduated. Um, and I, I was wondering about, is there information on whether the participants have been paid for something previously for, from another project ah. to make that differentiation, or maybe even understand if they already have that economic kind of motivation because of something like that? Yeah, yeah. So one of the things that we did as part of this uh, project was to look at the number of government programs that existed in each of these villages. And the number ranged from something like 60 to 137 or 140. There's just an enormous density of external interventions in Himachal villages. Uh, we do have the data on how many different such programs or different such organizations each respondent family is a member of. Uh, in this analysis, we just use the number of things in which people are members to yeah, as one of the controls. Uh, but we have other analyses in which we are trying to look at uh, uh, the, the nature of the social network in which people are connected to each other. As, uh, as something that might explain changes in motivation. So we haven't done that work yet. We just have looked at what, uh, what is the, just the raw number for each, each person. Yeah. But it, you know, it's, uh, I think the short answer is that the, that the nature of these net, organizational networks is immensely complex and very, very hard to disentangle. Uh, so yeah. yeah. That you know that perverse effect yeah. was already there to start with. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question, and you know, uh, I'm actually looking. Are you, if you are interested in social network analysis, I'll be happy to share the data with you to, to see if you want to use it. Yeah. Yes. Okay, Alvin Hopp from Agriculture Biological Engineering. So the European Union a few years ago they changed their agriculture subsidy program to require farmers to perform certain ecosystem services and best management practices. And I was wondering if you're aware of any effects of this program. Did it change farmers' behavior? Because mm -hmm. I see it's a similar scheme but in a different cultural setting. Yeah, and I think the similar programs are also there in the United States, where people are paid to reduce cultivation of land or to leave land fallow. Uh, for the most part, I think these are significant amounts of payments and roughly proportional to the benefits people might, farmers might be getting from that land if they were cultivating it. And I think if the payments are of such a high order, they probably have positive effects on behavior. I don't know that there's anybody out there looking at effects on motivations. So, yeah. But you know, it, if you are a consequentialist, you would say, I really don't care about motivations. If they're doing the thing that they should be doing as a result of program incentives, that's what I want. And then the question is, how long are you going to keep paying them? 
Uh, so changes in motivations are important. Uh, they may not be seen as being important in the short run. Yeah. I'm still not clear why the beneficiaries increased environmental degradation. I don't the causality of that, but I don't what led to increased yeah. forest harvest. Yeah. I mean, I see that as, so I see the three results of uh, change in motivations and behavior and in forest condition as being very consistent with each other. So if I come to think of forests as being something that exists for my economic benefit, then I would be perfectly, I would be happier or I would be less conflicted about using it for more economic benefit. And the two most common ways of extracting benefit from forests in the hills are for firewood and for fodder. So I see the results about increased use of forests and about uh, motivations changing towards economic motivations as being entirely uh, consistent, yeah. Cynthia, do you have a question? Yeah. Yes. So your takeaway would be about PDS in terms of if you're, you know, if you don't have all those four conditions met, you're better off not doing it. I mean, because the outcome actually could be worse than if you didn't do the program at all. If the consequences are they degrade more, and the motivation is now economic, then their intrinsic motivation is gone. So your work is kind of a yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I hesitate to draw, so. <laughs> You're trying to pin me down. Uh, I think, in general, payments to bring about environmentally positive outcomes is, giving people money to bring about environmentally positive outcomes is uh, a more expensive approach than one in which you are trying to bring about similar changes by engaging people in changing their behaviors. Uh, but that doesn't mean that payments for environmental services will never work. Uh, nor does it, so you know, the other thing I, I wanted, you know, so this is something that didn't come up in the, in the discussion. I think when institutions change, when formal or informal institutions change, they create uncertainty. And this uncertainty is often associated with people uh, working more in their own interests. And so when you see a program being implemented, which is changing the relative, uh, the calculation of relative benefits by recipients of program benefits, that may be creating uncertainty. And if you continue the program for a long time, that may lead to the change in the institution becoming uh, more widely accepted and thereby reducing uncertainty and thereby potentially more positive uh, outcomes over time. But with those qualifications, I, would, I am less convinced that payment for environmental services will lead us to the sustainability mecca. But I have many friends who would disagree. <laughs> OK, looks like we're done. So thank you very much, Arun, for two very interesting talks. And safe travels back to the cold beach. <laughs>